Talk Radio. Michiamo Afura Kanu Afura Kaitlu in the Akanto Narason Da Medinde Ojira for Kwesi Radna and Pata Akan. Akwamu Maina Maruka SCP Mu Ojira for that means greeting to all Afura Kani Afura Kaitni, meaning Africans, black people today. Is Akanfo Nanason Day, ancient authentic Akan, ancestral religion. Day, my name is Ojirafo Kwesi Radnehem Pata Akan. Ojirafo of the Akwamu Nation in North America. Yet I say we thank you once again for tuning in to the show. We're going to put some links in the chat room real quick. Um, for the information that we are, will be dealing with tonight. Um, We're going to put the Ocom Economic Development page and link on the site or in the chat room. If you have a question or a comment on the phone line, you can hit the number one so that we can see that your hand is raised. If you have, uh, if you'd like to interact in the chat room, then you would have to uh, log in with the username. You have to have a username in order to interact in the chat room. If you um, don't have a username, you can sign up for one very quickly in Blog Talk so you can interact. All right. So I just want to put this a um, couple of more links in the chat room. Um, for the individuals who are new to the programs, we have three different programs on a weekly basis. We have Akan from Nana Son, ancient authentic, authentic Akan ancestral religion on Joda, Monday night. Um, we have Ojida, which means purification, on Binada or Apinada, Tuesday nights, where we deal with ancestral religion in general. Um, we deal with the Akan expression of ancestral religion specifically on Joda on Monday night, tonight's show, but on Tuesday nights, we deal with uh, ancestral religion in general, the show is called Ojida because we're dealing with purification, purifying um, the knowledge, culture, cosmology, philosophy, and so forth, ritual practice of ancestral religion, and showing how it impacts every aspect of our lives as Afurai Kani, Afurai Kani people and its application. So um, we deal with texts from ancient Kemet as well as texts from ancient Kana, Nubia, as well as our cultures around the continent and into the Western Hemisphere as we have brought our culture and our language and our ritual practices here and have continued to pass those practices on through our blood circles right here where we are in North America and Central America, South America, the Caribbean, and so forth. That includes the various forms of ancestral religion, such as hoodoo and juju and voodoo and obia and winti and lukumi and various forms, um, vodun and so forth, um, that we practice and we continue to practice and that we inherit directly from our direct blood ancestors and ancestors to the present day. So that's what we did on um, Ojira, the Ojira program on Benada or Abinada Tuesday nights. And then, we, have, of course, we have the uh, show Egua Marketplace on Awukuda, Akuada Wednesday nights. Egua means marketplace. We deal with Afurakani, Afurakani, either African black businesses, organizations, and institutions. We have individuals come on and talk about their businesses, organizations, institutions, products, and services that they are um, impacting our community with in a positive fashion. Also, how their ancestral religious values inform their service to the community. Uh, in the context of that, we've also launched and published and launched the Okom Economic Development Model and operations of the Oklahoma Economic Development Model. You can check that out on the Oklahoma Economic Development page. We have published a model. You can download it for free, of course, talking about our approach to economic development rooted in our ancestral, religious, cultural values. And then we also have the strategy as a component of that model where we starve the beast and feed the prize. So we check out we make an assessment on a weekly basis to determine what funds we have been spending, what we would have spent potentially, what we would have wasted potentially with white businesses, 
spending that money with white businesses like Starbucks or Chipotle or whatever and spending five, ten, fifteen dollars at these places, we starve that white beast, reallocate those funds, take those funds away from those businesses and feed the pride, reallocate them towards the Apurakani or Apuraikani business organization or institution of the week. We are targeting fifty two Afurakani, Afurakani businesses, organizations, and institutions, um, one one per week for 52 weeks. Um, and, and this particular week, the organization, or actually the business, is Pan-African Design. And so what we're going to do is we're going to put a, a direct link to that business in the chat room as well. But the link to that business is also on our Ocom Economic Development page. So we put that in the chat room as well. The brother Alsar Ma Akkeru Aman Ra, a Pan African Designs owner and apparel company, has very um, you know detailed, um, valuable apparel, um, very well done, very meticulously put together, t-shirts, sweatshirts, hoodies. It also has. Um, Afurakani, Afurakani flags, red, black, and green flags with the um, symbol of the sacred hawk, the Heru hawk in the midst of the red, black, and green flag, which has become a very um, well-known symbol. You've probably seen that symbol on T-shirts and, and on the flags and, and hats and everything else all over the Internet that's coming from Pan-African design. So that is the uh, business of the week. So, again, um, one business per week for 52 weeks, and what, what we do is, the reason why we're targeting one business per week for 52 weeks is because if you have, if you spend, if you make that assessment and you decide to starve the beast and feed the pride and instead of spending, you know, $5 in the course of a week on some Arizona iced tea once a day for five days or spending $5 at, at Starbucks to purchase some coffee, which is actually not beneficial for your health, or spending $7 at Chipotle or something like that through, through the course of a week, you can save that uh, $17 that you would have wasted with the white snarl spray and, of course, reallocate that $17 to the business of the week. You're either going to support one of the businesses of the white snarl spray or you're going to support your own people, black businesses in the community that are producing products and services that are actually serving our community. So if one person does that, if you do that, then you've reallocated, you've starved the beast and you've fed the pride, you've reallocated your own fund from a white business, white individual feeding their families and, you know, um, putting their children through school and purchasing clothes and purchasing food for their families with your money. That money should be going to black businesses so they can, number one, serve us with the products and services that we actually need that are actually beneficial for us. And at the same time, they're able to expand their businesses, keep their businesses open, hire our people in the community to work at the businesses, to expand their product line, expand their services, and actually support their own families as well. So if one person does that, if you do that and you, you know, you gave them $17, that's good. If, if a 1,000 people did that and we target one business per week, then a 1,000 people, of course, reallocating $17 is $17,000 of capital infusion going to one black business school, educational center, um, you know, apparel company like, like this one, independently owned apparel company. They're doing their own, you know, work. They're not contracting work out to other people and just putting their name on it, they're doing their own work. So um, this is week number 13. And we've had, you know, a number of different businesses. We've had 12 different businesses that the community has supported over these past 12 weeks. This is week number 13. And, again, this is um, the week for Pan-African Design. So please support that business uh, when you go to the Ocom Economic Development page. What you'll find is the model. You can download the model. Of course, it's a free download. You can study that model. Um, you can also see the four-part series we did on Blog Talk Radio, or Home Parts 1, 2, 3, and 4, where we go into detail and explain the model 
as well as its applications with regard to indigenization, with regard in the truth, and it's not the Moorish nonsense, um, with regard to nation building, I might test you, a number of different things. We also have the broadcast, um, Ekuakodi, economic warfare, um, and we also have the broadcast talking about uh, Sankofa, or no, Kwarefo, and Amamre, um, dealing with our independent distributor program where you can become the distributor of our soft cover books. We've published 16 books to date, all of the ebook versions of our books. We've made available as free downloads from our website. So you can download every one of our books for free at any time. And that's permanent. We, we always will continue that. The soft cover versions of our books, we do uh, print in house on our own printers in color. Um, we do sell the soft cover versions of our 16 books. They range between $8 and $11. And in addition to that, anyone who orders 10 books or more, like some people will order the first 10 out of the 16 books, you automatically receive any order of 10 books or more, whether you order 10 or 11 or 12, or 13, 14, 15, or the whole 16 book set, you automatically receive a 30% off for those larger orders. So, for example, if you order the first 10 books, you would, um, instead of paying $96 for 10 books, it's $66 for 10 books, so it's basically $6.60 per book. Um, but in addition to that, we have the No Quare Flow distributor program, which means if you would like to generate income for yourself, if you're not working or, or if you are working but you want to generate additional income, you can become a distributor of our soft cover books. You purchase them wholesale from us and then you sell them retail. And typically, when people see the books, if you're at work or on the train, on the bus, or somewhere, and people see you reading the books, and they see, for example, Kukutun Tun, the ancestral jurisdiction, and on the front cover it says Jesus never existed, and Muhammad never existed, and Abraham never existed, and Buddha never existed, Brahman never existed, and so forth. People see that cover, and they're just intrigued by the, the information alone. And if they ask you where to get the book from, you say, I, well, I actually sell them. It's only $10, and pe some people just want to buy it just to see what the information that's in it. As well, some people just want to think that they can debunk the information and purchase it for that reason alone. And then once they actually get it and study it, they'll see that, of course, irrefutable, but they have learned something. And then they can convey that information to other people as well. So um, you purchase the books for 30% off wholesale, and then you sell them uh retail, at the retail price. And that way, you know, we have a uh, means by which if people are not working, it doesn't matter what your previous work history is, Afurakani, Afurakani people have a, uh, an option through our ancestral culture to be able to generate income for themselves while at the same time uh, distributing a product that's actually benefiting our people. When we say benefiting our people, it's not just intellectual People get our information, they learn information, for example, about holistic health, and they change their diet, overcome illnesses, get information about spiritual culture and ritual practice, overcome stress and all kinds of other negative behaviors and so forth. So things that impact people on a regular basis, if you have chronic illnesses or obesity or whatever, um, we also have a program, you know, um, dealing with overcoming drug addiction through ancestral religion. Numerous people have stopped drinking alcohol, smoking marijuana, smoking cigarettes and other drugs and so forth because they utilize that method, the kum method as we call it, for overcoming, kum ritual method for overcoming addiction. Um, we're impacting people tangibly, things that are causing them uh, issues chronically every moment of every day. So they're getting possession of this information applied to their lives and overcome these things that have been crippling them on a daily basis. So this is a benefit for the people. So when you sell the information, the books, not only are they becoming aware intellectually of the things that they're suffering from, then they're able to overcome them. And then they can also have the opportunity to purchase books, sell books as well, and generate income for themselves. So it's actually benefit, benefiting them economically as well. So this is what we so, so we have a broadcast on that and you can listen to that broadcast as well. All of that is on the page. All of the various businesses that we're targeting and the business list is growing. 
um, is on, on, the, on the page as well, the Oklahoma Economic Development page. And in addition to that, all of the interviews with all the various businesses, business owners, organization owners, founders, institution owners, founders, who came on the show and talked about their business or organization or institution, you can click and listen to their uh, interviews as well and them talking about in detail who they are, why they started their business or organization or institution, what their philosophy behind serving our community is and how it's influenced and informed by our ancestral religious values. So all of that information is on the Oklahoma Economic Development page. All right, so we also need to put another link in the chat room. I want to make sure we didn't um, miss this link. So that was, okay, we did put that link in the chat room. Um, the Patat Sasa Tim page, we put that link in there. And we also want to put the link to the Okra Okra Complex book. Because we'll be touching on that information tonight as well as um, one more link. Which is the uh Afuraka Afuraikai link. And we're putting that in the chat room for the book. Afuraka Afuraika is the origin of the term Africa. So we're gonna to touch on that as well. And of course, as we said, all of the ebook versions of our publications are free downloads, so you can get to those directly. All right, so we just want to give us one second. Okay, so um, for what we're dealing with tonight, Akampo Nanasom is ancient, authentic Akan ancestral religion. So we deal with, as we said earlier, the Akan expression of ancestral religion, of Afurakani, Afuraikaitni, ancestral religion. Um, okay, and somebody said we, we're having a problem with the link. We, we may, probably because we didn't put the www before, but we just put the direct link to the book in the chat room so you should be able to see it. Okay. All right, so um, we on Monday night, draw the Monday, we go specifically with the Akan expression of ancestral religion. Number one, because we're Akan, but number two, um, because there's a great deal of misinformation, as, as we pointed out in the past, about Akan cosmology being propagated from the Western Hemisphere, but also from the continent, from individuals on the continent, so-called elders and eldresses, who have been infected with Islam, infected with Christianity, infected with Hinduism, infected with Buddhism, infected with various forms of white culture, and those infections, especially over the past 200 years, have found their way to be woven into the fabric of the culture. So therefore, when people come in contact with individuals from the continent today, for those who are infected with these perverse philosophies, on the surface, they appear to be just regular elders and eldresses who speak their own language and live their own culture and have been practicing rituals for hundreds of years and have a lineage going back hundreds of years, and it appears that it's authentic. But then when you look through and find out the true story, you'll find that these individuals have been influenced by white culture and have woven those perverse influences into the cosmology. And the next thing you know, you find perverse philosophies pseudo philosophy is being masked under the ancestral religion. So, for example, if when you ever hear somebody say that the Akan religion is monotheistic, then you know automatically, we've talked about this before, you know automatically this individual doesn't know what they're talking about at all. They have no clue. And it doesn't matter if they're an Okomfo, a priest or a priestess, or a Bosomfo, if they're a so-called academic, if they're a PhD, all of that means Nothing. If they're talking about monotheism, that means white culture, white perversity has infected them. And the whites in their offspring, of course, have been trying to promote the idea of monotheism 
since the so-called the 12,800s, the so-called 1800s in Ghana, for example, then you also had white so-called Muslims and brainwashed Negroes who became Muslims who have been trying to promote that nonsense even prior to that. It didn't really begin to stick until about the 12,900s, the so-called 1900s, when some of our people started going along with that, that nonsense. And then it began to be woven into the way people spoke about the culture and today, when you have all these churches and brainwashed Negroes talking about the culture, then some of that filters down to people who are practicing traditional culture, but they, they haven't let go of the white culture altogether. And then you have our people over here repeating that nonsense. We, we have, for example, our broadcast talking about the idiocy of monotheism. And we talked about abosum kem, which means the various divinities, ancestral polytheism, there are many gods and goddesses headed up by the great god and great goddess Inyamewa and Inyame or Aminet and Amen. But we go into detail about that in a couple of our broadcasts, but that's just an example. If you hear somebody speaking like that, you know they have no knowledge of what they're talking about. So that, um, there are a number of different uh, corruptions that have crept in. So on our Kanfo Nanasom, on this particular show, we deal with Akan cosmology in detail, ancestral religious practice in detail. We've proven numerous times in the different publications that Akan people come from ancient Kanak, which is a title for ancient Nubia, um, migrated after the fall of civilization, after the Greek and Roman and Assyrian invasions and later Arabs and so forth, the ancient Kemet and parts of northern uh, Kanak, Nubia, some of our people migrated to the western part of the continent, reestablished ancient Kanak, Nubia, it became known as the ancient empire of Ghana or Ghana. That was a couple of thousand years ago. Then a thousand years later, some of our people becoming brainwashed and allying with the white Arabs began to invade those areas. Some of our people embraced the idiocy of Islam. We saw that region deteriorating. So some of our people, Akanfo, Akan people, migrated from that region, moved further south, and reestablished about a thousand years ago, Akan or the Kana civilization, the Akana civilization or Akan civilization in the forest belt and savannah region of today's Ghana and Ivory Coast. And we were there and have been there ever since. A few hundred years later, some of our people, as a result of internecine warfare, got captured as prisoners of war, sold to the whites in their offspring, and were forced. Uh, to the Western Hemisphere, into North America, Central America, South America, the Caribbean, and Europe as a result of the Amusu al the great perversity, the enslavement era. So this is how we, as Akan as Akan people, came from ancient Kanat Nubia to the Western part of the continent and eventually into the Western Hemisphere. We've carried our ancestral religious practices with us everywhere we've gone, of course, because we are tuned to the Supreme Being, the Great Mother and Great Father, wherever we are. <clears throat> and we do so through the agency of the Abosom, the Akan term for deities, ancestral spirits, spirit forces in nature, and the Nananon Nsamapo, the spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors of our direct blood lineage, blood circles. So um, we've carried those traditions wherever we've gone. This is why Akan people still speak the same ancestral language of ancient Kemet is directly derived, just like various other people on the continent do the same thing. This is why you can find the various terms in the length, in the Akan language that you find in ancient Kemet, the names of deities. Every Akan person is named after deities from ancient Kemet as soon as we are born. So names like, as we talk about the Akradin Boson, the deities that govern the solar, lunar, and planetary bodies of the seven-day week in Akan culture, when people are born on the different days, we have the names of the divinities that govern those days. So Kwame and Kojo and Ama and Akua and Kwesi and Kweku and Akua and so forth. We're named after these different divinities. The deities Osar and Oset and Herubahudet uh, and Sekhmet and Set and Nebethet and Heru, son of Osar and Oset and Wachet and Nekembet and Het Heru, and Amen Men, 
These 11 divinities are the divinities that govern the solar, lunar, and planetary bodies that govern the seven-day week. And they did that, of course, in ancient Kemet. And they're the same divinities that we still invoke today that we're named after. Every Akan person is named after that we still worship, we get possessed by, communicate with. They exist by the same names in Akan culture to this very day. And the same is true of the various other divinities in our publications bear that up. So this is why we go into detail about actual cosmology, the nature and function of the supreme being, Nyame Wa, Nyame, the great mother, great father, the creator and creatress, Nyokumpon and Nyokumpon, who are called Ra and Ra Ed and Kemet. Ra Ku becomes Nyanku, Nanku in Akan and Nyokumpon, the great pawn, Nanku or Ra Ku, with the title of Ra and Ancient Kemet, is what we say, Nyanku Pon or Nyokumpon in Akan. It's the same divinity, the same with Nyokumpon, which is S and so forth. So we have numerous publications. Our books, for example, go into detail about these divinities, this culture, this blood circle. Um, and then we have broadcasts where we clarify these publications. So what we're going to deal with today, we started a process um, a couple of weeks ago dealing with ritual. We talked about the Nkomre, the ancestral shrine and how to establish an ancestral shrine. We talked about Nkomre, ancestral shrine, communication, and liberation. How we utilize ancestral religion, invoking the Abosom, the divinities, evoking the ancestors and ancestors, and being empowered and guided towards victory to overcome enslavement and end enslavement in the Western Hemisphere through the practice of ancestral religion. So as some fools would like to say, if your ancestral religion was powerful, how come you were enslaved and it didn't help you? In reality, when you actually know what no true history, you'll find that it's only through the ancestral religion that we ended slavery. That didn't just happen in Haiti. It also happened, of course, in Jamaica with the Maroons and so forth, and Suriname with the Maroons, and in Brazil with the Maroon Society, but also the Maroon Societies right here in North America. And we show that in detail, and we talk about that in our book, Who Do People, Afurakanu, Afurakainu in North America, Akan, custodians of who do from ancient, who do or Undunu land, Hanit, Nubia. We have the book dealing with that, broadcast dealing with that. But it's through the ancestral, our ancestral religious practices that we were empowered and guided by the Abosom and Nananun, Usamapo, the deities and ancestral spirits, to overcome our enemies and bring an end to enslave. That's a direct result of what our ancestresses and ancestors did through ancestral religion, and we have the capacity to do the same thing today. Physically enslaved, we're economically, politically, socially, and spiritually, mentally enslaved, and that leads us to be acquiescent with regard to our enemies, the whites and our offspring. Some of our people are snapping and waking up out of that coma. For example, you see people in Baltimore waking up and waging war against the whites and our offspring, the criminal police in those areas. And you will continue to see more of our people as they wake up. They won't sit back and be acquiescent. They're going to wage war. And it's not going to stop. It's going to increase. Every time a white cop murders a black individual, it's coming to the point and it's going to come to the point that the black community will exterminate that white cop. That's going to begin to happen on a more consistent basis and you already see it happening now. So we are the only ones that can stop police so-called brutality. We've done a number of broadcasts, a three-part series on that information. Um, you can check that out on our YouTube channel and so forth. So what we're going to do, so we did the Nkombre Ancestral Shrine Communication and Liberation and talked about how to establish an ancestral shrine. That was the first part of this series on ritual practice. The second part was uh, last week, we talked about the Okra, the Okra, the soul, the divine consciousness. The Kra or Kara in the Akan language is the same as the Ka in ancient Kemet. Um, the soul, the divine consciousness, called Ka, male, Kaet or Ka, female. You have Ka in Akan or Kara in Akan and Krawa or Kra in Akan, female, male and female. The soul, the divine consciousness, we talked about the ritual um, 
of akraguare or soul washing, cleansing the head, and so forth. So we talked about that last week. Um, we were talking about soul responsibility, not S O L E individual responsibility, even though it's related, but S O U L soul responsibility. We talked about the nature of the soul, the divine consciousness, and how spirituality revolves around us aligning our thoughts, intentions, and actions with divine order as encoded within the Akra, which is the soul, the divine consciousness, a divinity, a personal bosom that dwells in the head region that was assigned to us pre-incarnation by Nyamewa Nyame, the Supreme Being. So now we're going to deal, we talked about the Akra, Okrawa, or the Ka, the Kayat. Tonight we're going to talk about the Ba and the Ba'at the spirit, the divine living energy that animates us as Afurakani Afuraikaidi people and Afurakani Afuraikaidi people only. So the Ka and the Ba of ancient Kemet is the Ka and the Ba or the Kra and the Bra. In our Khan culture, of course, Ba or Bra means life existence, the spirit of life or existence. This is why the root Ba means offspring. So for example, a child is oba, meaning offspring, that which has come forward. A female is called oba, O-B-A-A, oba. The first A is high, the second A is low. Our language is a tonal language, so language is so to say. Oba, the first A is high, the second A is low, that, that means female. Oba, if you were to say the first A low and the second A high, oba, then you would be saying he opened, meaning to open something. Oba means he opened. Oba means female or woman. And then you have oba ni or oba ni or also oberima, meaning male. So you have oba meaning child, offspring, oba meaning female, and oba ni or obarima, oberima, meaning male. The root is ba, which is the life. Spirit, the spirit of life, divine living energy. The same ba from ancient Kemet, meaning the divine living energy that animates us. It's Apurakani, Apurakani people. So, we talked when we had a broadcast um, a couple of months back dealing with the ba in detail with regard to just the nature of the ba and the ba, its relationship to the Ka and God and the rela- its relationship to our spirit body is one of our spiritual organs. We, we had a seven-part series of the spiritual organs within Afurakani, Afurakani people. That was one of the um, components, one of the segments of that series, um, one of the installments. So what we want to talk about tonight, of course, is um, r- the ritual aspect of it. dealing with ritual, and we call this uh, broadcast in spirit and discipline. In spirit, discipline. So when you in spirit something, you're in spirit thing or bringing spiritual power, um, enlightenment inside of something. Remember, we did a broadcast as well on the etymology of the term religion and spirit. And we showed that spirituality and religion based on the ancient real definitions coming from our ancestral languages, are the exact same term. So all of this foolishness about there's a difference between religion and spirituality comes directly from the whites and their offspring. So we went into detail about that. And the term spirit, the pair from ancient Kemet, talking about to make, to come forth. And it's the same thing with the term ba, meaning to come forward. That ba bird, when you see the ba bird, the divine sacred entity. Sometimes it's just the bird itself. Sometimes it's the bird and it has a little bowl in front of it of burned incense, talking about that divine fire that's moving through our bloodstream, through our cardiovascular system, that um, enlivening energy, divine living energy, um, coming physically through the sun as the transmitter of that kind of energy, but the spiritual power animating that energy. And you have a little bowl of burning incense showing that it's the fire energy within us. And then the bird showing that it's uh, flying through us or moving through us, constantly animating us, just like the wings are animating and moving the bird and so forth. So sometimes it's just shown as the bird. Sometimes it's shown as the bird with a human head, and the head is the, the head of the person. So 
when you look at that Bob Bird, just like we talked about, uh, the soul, the divine consciousness, the seat of the Kra in the person, in the Afurakani, Afurakani person, is the brain. That is the shrine of the soul. It is the seat or the throne, quote unquote, of the soul. So, the heart and lung complex is the seat or the throne of the Ba and the Ba'et, the divine living energy. And of course, through the heart and lung complex, as the heart and lungs continue to pump and expand and contract, then they, you know, the purified blood, the blood is purified through the lungs and then it's sent out through the heart and sent throughout the entire circulatory system. The blood carries um, the life force energy and so forth. So the seat of that um, activity is in the heart-lung complex. If you look at the heart and lung complex and you look at the five bird itself from the frontal position, you'll see the breast of the bird and you see the downward folded wing. If you look at the heart and lung complex, you see the two lungs surrounding the heart. The heart is like the breast of the bird and the lungs are like the two folded wings. So you have that little Bob bird sitting right in your chest. And of course, um, the head of the bird is your head because that's the divine living energy assigned to you by Ra and Ra'et, the creator and creatress. Ra and Ra'et are the great Ba and the great Ba'et, the great divine living energy animating and permeating all of the created universe, all of naturally created entities in the universe. A portion of that divine living energy, just like you have a portion of the air that surrounds the entire earth, a very small portion of that you breathe in and encapsulate within your lung, animate you. And you breathe out, of course, you have a direct channel from your lungs through your trachea to the air outside. So you have a tiny portion of that air that moves the entire earth. You have a portion of it in you that animates your miniature earth. The same is true of the divine living energy that permeates creation. A portion of that, a child of that energy, a sphere of that energy is sent and directed to dwell with inside of us. So when our ba or our ba'et, our divine living energy is an entity seated in the heart-lung complex, that's the physical seat that the spiritual force is within that, in that seat, within that shrine, animating us. It is the energetic link to Ra and Ra for us, just like you have a a direct link from the air in your lungs to the air outside, the energy within your body, just like solar energy that's in your body, the heat that's in your body is directly connected to the sun, ultimately through the sun rays and so forth, with well, the divine living energy of Ra and Raya transmitted through the sun, of course, a portion of that is within us, and there's a direct link between that divine living entity within us that's animating us, to the great Ba and by Ra and Ra, the creator and creator, in Yonkum Thong and in Yonkum Thong. So first we're going to read something from the, um, from the Okra Okra complex, the soul of Akan Po, and then we're going to talk about some information that we have in the, in our book, Afuraka Afuraka, the origin of the term Africa, talking about the nature of the Ba, and then we're going to get into some aspect of ritual practice dealing with that from and in fact let me before we do that we want to put the link to the uh we're going to put the link to the aboa on the page on our website that was one of the links that we mentioned in the promo for the show all right so that's in there right now okay so if you look in the Okra Okra Complex book, The Soul of Akan Fo, on page 27, we mentioned, we show the image of the Ba bird itself. The Ba bird is, and this, this, this is an, um, seen from the papyrus of Ani, the Ani Shefu, or the Ani papyrus, from the Runu Pert and Heru, the so-called Book of Coming Forth by David, known as the Book of the Dead, the wing of the heart seen, and you see the heart the Av being weighed against the shoe of Ma'at. Um, in that weighing, you'll see that the Ba bird is awaiting 
the judgment, the weighing, to see what takes place. And what we say here is note that the Ba spirit, in the form of the human-headed bird, the head of the deceased individual, also awaits the result of the weighing. The Ba and Ba Es are the masculine and feminine terms for our divine living energy, the conscious living spirit entity which animates us, like the solar fire or heat within our bodies, which permeates our entire being and radiates from us. And the Ka and Ba, also the Ka Es and Ba Es, the soul and the spirit unite. It is the union of the soul and the divine life spirit. The Ba and Ba Es carry the energy, Ra and Ra Es, the creator or creatress, called Inyokumpon and Inyokumpon in Aka. It is the radiant life energy of the Ba, Ba Es, which allows us to consciously and energetically link to the Abosom in all of creation and activates our inherited energy complex, She and Shebiya. And we talk about that in the book, of course. The term Ba in Kemet is Bara in Akan, meaning life existence. The union of the Obra and Okra is the union of the divine life spirit with the soul. So we're talking about the energy link to Ra and Ra, that divine living energy dwelling within us, is our energetic link to the creator and creatress, the divine living energy that animates all of the created universe, created with a capital C. And it also activates our inherited energy complex, the Shea and Shebiya. So first, when we talk about um, the energetic link to the created universe, everything that exists in the world is not created with a capital C. It doesn't come into being by divine fiat, divine sanction. So we use the, the example frequently. Um, you have the coca plant, which is a naturally occurring plant that's a naturally developed creation that comes from the earth and so forth. When the whites and our spring decided a number of years ago to take the coca plant, take it through a perverse process that they came up with to create a product and bring forth a product in the world that never existed in the true story of creation, which is crack cocaine, that is an, a product that exists in the world, but it did not come into being. It wasn't created with a capital C. It didn't have a divine inspiration. It didn't come into being via divine fiat or sanction. It was something that was made but not created. It's not naturally occurring. When we talk about naturally occurring, we mean things that are naturally occurring, but also things that come into being via divine inspiration, we're being motivated by Inyame wa Inyame, Amenet and Amen in the Supreme Being to bring something into being, some innovative thing into being. That is also a creation, ultimately, of Inyame wa Inyame through the Creator and Creatress, Ra and Ra'et. And of course, the Creator and Creatress, Ra and Ra'et, serve Amen and Amenet. They are grandchildren of Amen and Amenet. So there's a difference between the Creator and Creatress and the Supreme Being. We've dealt with that in the past in different broadcasts. Um, so if we're inspired by the Supreme Being to bring something into being or innovate something, that's also a divine creation with a capital C because it came into being through the spark of the Supreme Being. But if, it's not, if it doesn't carry that spark of innovation from the Supreme Being, it exists, but it was not created. It was made but not created. So we have a divine living energy conscious living entity dwelling within us, a spirit force that we can direct. It's like you can direct a bird, a homing pigeon, to go give a message. You have people dealing with that, and that goes back thousands of years, of course. Um, people dealing with falcons and things like that. Um, just like you can direct a bird to go do this and go do that, you can direct a little bird or divine living energy within you to move to different parts of your being to connect with the forces in nature, that your direct connection, energy-wise, to the forces in creation. All of the forces in nature, the abosom, the forces in nature, are spirits that animate the suns, moons, planets, stars, black substance of space, oceans, rivers, earth mother, mountains, thunder and lightning, and so forth. These physical aspects of creation are animated by spiritual entities, just like your physical body is animated by your spirit. So our energy link 
to these other forces in nature is the ba and bayat, because they have a ba or bayat as well, because they are all children of Ra and Raya, the creator and creatress. And Ra and Raya place some of their divine living, animating energy within all of their creation, including the deities first, and then including us and plant life, animal life, and mineral life as well. So we have a direct energetic link. Our ba is our direct energetic link to the forces in nature and, of course, to the creature and prey dress as well, Ra and Raya. Now, the whites and their offspring, of course, are totally dispossessed of that. So all they have is lower-level electromagnetic energy, just like, you know, a piece of paper or, a, you know, um, just an inanimate object, just by virtue of the fact that they're on the planet Earth, even though they're not a naturally occurring entity, just like crack cocaine. You're on Earth. Earth is surrounded by a magnetosphere. So the magnetosphere of Earth envelops everything. So you have some lower level electromagnetic energy that allows you to operate and move around. Just like, you know, um, the energy in a battery can move a car around and things like that. Just like magnetism with a magnet can move things around and so forth. But that electromagnetic energy is cut off. That lower level electromagnetic output is cut off from Ra and Riot. Ra and Riot repel spirits of disorder. The whites and their offspring incarnate as spirits of disorder because they do not have a Kra, a Kra, a soul, a divine consciousness. They don't have a divinity dwelling in the head region. They don't have that force in the head that pulls them towards divine order every moment of every day. That spiritual force that we experience that we can communicate a divinity that dwells within the head region that directs us and motivates us to move in harmony with divine order every moment of every day. And our spirituality is related and rooted in us aligning with the force that dwells in our head region. The whites and offspring do not have that force. They repel that force. And this is why they became the whites and offspring. So they are spirits without souls. They have a lower level, weak spirit body, perverse spirit body, devoid of soul, but also devoid of divine living. So they just have lower level electromagnetic output without divine living energy. It's very similar, and we've given this example of someone can be, it can be very hot outside, no clouds in the sky, 100 degrees. You can receive direct sunlight. It browns your skin. If you're an Afurakani, Afurakani person, it energizes us and so forth. That direct sunlight allows us to manufacture vitamin D, for example, in the skin it's just because it's direct. Now, somebody can go inside of a shed with no windows, totally dark, and close the door. Now, they will feel the heat of the sun simply because it's 100 degrees outside, the sun is shining on the shed, and therefore... It's hot inside of the shed, so they will feel the residual effect of sunlight, but they are not receiving direct sunlight. And because they're not receiving direct sunlight, they're not being energized by the sun, they're not being browned by the sun, they're not manufacturing vitamin D because of the sun. If they remained in that dark space for months or something like that, their eyes and so forth and their body would deteriorate. Even though they're feeling the residual effect of sunlight, which is the heat that's in the in the shed, they don't have direct, have a direct experience of the sun. The whites and their offspring are the same way. Because of their repulsive structure, their spiritual structure, their spirit body is repulsive. It's a disordered entity like cancer cells within the body, disfigured cells that are averse to the entire body and the entire body is averse to them. And this is why they have a temporal existence and the body destroys them through the immune system cells and kills them and isolates them and expels them from the body. These spirits of disorder repel and are repulsive to of divine order and the spirits of order. The Afurakani, Afurakani people, we come into being, we incarnate as spirits of order. We're, we have a cross, soul of divine consciousness. We have an anchor in divine order. And it's our responsibility to live in harmony with divine order. And when we make mistakes, we have ancestral religion to realign ourselves through ritual, the ritual incorporation of divine law and the ritual restoration of divine balance. That is the expansive, those are the expansive and contractive poles of the ancestral religion. So through ritual, 
we incorporate those things, objects, deeds, and entities we need to incorporate in order to align our thoughts, intentions, and actions with divine order every moment of every day. And through ritual, we establish and reestablish balance when imbalance has occurred by rejecting those things, objects, deeds, and entities through ritual so that we can restore balance to ourselves when imbalance has occurred. So the incorporation of law and the restoration of balance through ritual, the expansive and contractive pose of ancestral religious practice that is the essence of nanasong, afurakani, afurakani, or African ancestral religion. We have the capacity to do that. We're anchored in order because we have a divinity dwelling in the head region, the okra, or okrawa, the ka, the kayak. And everything we do revolves around that force that's pulling us to align ourselves with divine order every moment of every day. The whites in our screen, because of their behavior, repel their own cry. And once that soul was separated from them, now they're spirits without soul. Spirits of disorder. They are cancerous cells now in the body of black humanity. And they operate in a disjointed, discordant, disfigured fashion. And they have a temporal existence. So um, because of that, they're repulsive. So just like you have two magnets on the table and they're facing, if the light polarity is faced and they jump together, they attract. But if the polarities are reversed, then they repel one another consistently. Immutable law. The white and narrow spring are spirits of disorder because they don't have an anchor in order because of who they are and who, how they incarnate. And there's no changing that reality until they become extinct. That's who they are. So they are repulsive to divine order and spirits of order, whether it's Afurakani, Afurakani people, whether it's plant life, animal life, and mineral life, whether it's the forces in nature, the divine spirits of divine order, the embodiments of divine order. So therefore, they are repulsive. They cannot receive the divine living energy of Ra and Raya because they are repulsive. They are like the individual inside of the shed. They can feel some heat just by virtue of the fact that they're on earth, but they have no direct sunlight. The forces of nature do not possess the white's neural spring. Forces of nature do not guide the white's neural spring. They do the same thing to the white's neural spring that the immune system cells and other cells in the body do to cancerous cells. They isolate those cells and eventually eradicate those cells through immune system cells, immune system individuals. Lymphatic system cells, individuals who isolate those cancer cells and eradicate. So this is what's going on. So we, we always have to make that distinction, distinction distinction to show there's a difference between us and them. When we talk about the whites in our spring, we're talking about white European, white Americans, white Arabs, white Hindus, white Asians, whether it's Japanese, Chinese, Cambodians, whoever white Hispanic, white pseudo-Native Americans who are just white Asians who invaded this hemisphere when our people had already migrated here thousands of years ago. These are the whites and their offspring. All non-black people, all non-Afuraikani, non-Afuraikani people are the whites and their offspring, and they incarnate as spirits of disorder, and they will continue to do so until we make them extinct. And that's immutable, and irrefutable reality. So once we understand that, we always make a distinction between them and us because these principles don't apply to them. So we have that divine living energy, that little quote-unquote bird dwelling within us, and we can direct that force in nature, that divine living energy to the different parts of our body. It's like you can direct energy to your legs, so muscular energy so you can stand up, to your arms so you can lift things and everything else. Divine living energy you can direct through ritual practice to the different parts of your body, but also critically to align with the forces in nature to empower yourself to execute your function in creation without creating disorder in the process. So first we want to quickly read something from um, our book, Afuraka Afuraka, the origin of the term Africa talking about the Ba and the Ba'ed is on in the second section of the book, in part two of the book, 
And of course, in this book, we prove conclusively that the term Africa comes directly from Akuraka. It does not come from Romans or Hindus or Greeks or um, Arabs or the Phoenicians. It has no etymological nor cosmological roots outside of the continent. And we prove that in the Medusa, in the hieroglyphs, the origin of the term and the cosmological foundation from how the term was birthed on the continent. And then we also show it in the Akan language, for example, as well. So in this particular book, in part two, we talk about the Ba and Ba'et, and we show some images. And we just want to go over that quickly. And before we go forward, I um, just want to make sure we didn't miss anything in the chat room right quick. Okay, let's see. want to make sure we didn't miss anything, any questions. Okay, and anybody who has any questions or comments, of course, you have click the number one on the phone line so you can see that your hand is raised. And then um, if you're in the chat room, you have to log in as a user in the chat room in order to interact, and then you can interact that way. All right, so when you go to the book Afuraka, Afuraka is the origin of the term Africa, page 14. Regarding the Ba and the Ba'et, okay, so we say we mentioned that Ra and Ra'et are the creator and creatress. Together they are the divine living energy moving throughout and animating all of their created entities and creation. Together they are the great, in the language of Kemet, the term for the conscious spirit of life and animation is Ba, represented by the bird. And we show that bird or a human-headed bird. Um, and then we also show the term for the soul is Ka, the life force moving through you giving you the ability to move, act, think, is your ba. When we transition from the world, the ba, life force spirit, leaves our body. It flies away from our bodies like a bird. This is one of the reasons why the ba is depicted as a bird or a human-headed bird in the illustrations of Knesset, Nubia, and Kemet. The human head on the bird being the head image of the deceased individual who is now a spirit, the ba also flies through, quote-unquote, animates or circulates throughout your entire being perpetually, making and keeping you alive throughout your existence in your physical body while living in the physical world, and specifically for us, not just keeping us alive, but linking us to the divine living energy outside of our body, direct energy link to the great spirit, Ra and Raya. Then we say, your ka is your divine consciousness. It is, a, it is a drop of divine consciousness, awareness, intelligence from the supreme being's ocean of consciousness. Your ka is that divine force of consciousness within your head that is always pulling you in the right direction, in the direction which is in harmony with divine order. It is up to you whether or not you harmonize with that pull or reject that pull and move in the other direction. The physiological center of the ka is the brain. The brain organizes all of the activities taking place within you. Yet your brain needs oxygen, carrying blood in order to function. The oxygen carrying blood permeates all of your organs and systems. It is through this all permeating substance that the entire body can function, live. The physiological residence of the Ba is within the oxygen carrying blood. And of course, the seat of that circulatory system is the heart. Just as your physical body contains a smaller body, the brain, the control center for the entire body, so does your spirit body, called the Sahu and Kemet and Sum Sum and Akan, contain a smaller spirit body, the spirit brain, your Ka, which is the control center for your entire spirit body. Your divine consciousness, your soul, your Ka is your spiritual brain. Just as your physical body, including the brain, your brain needs a continuously circulating life energy source oxygen carrying blood in order to function live, so does your sahu, your spirit body, which includes within it your ka, need a continuous life-animating force in order to function, live, operate. This is your ba. You thus have a force of life, existence, ba, and you have a consciousness, awareness, ka. You have a spirit, ba, that animates you, that makes you alive, and a soul, ka, that makes you aware. You are a conscious, ka, living, ba, being, operating through a physical body, 
called the Kat in Kemet. There are many other aspects of your spirit that comprise your entire being, just as there are many other organs beyond the brain that comprise your physical being. We focus here on the Ba and Ka, the two major aspects, because of the subject matter at hand, because we were focusing on Afura and Ka in this particular text. The Ba and the Ka are divine in provenance or origin and exist as components within Afura Kanu, Afura Kaitnu, African black people only. So we talk about, further in the text, we talk about Ba and Ba, the Ba and the Ba, Ra and Ra, the Great One, Great Trust, so the Great Ba and the Great Ba'at, and we go into some more detail with regard to that. We talk about the deities that animate the black substance of space of the great Ka and Ka'at. We talk about that, and we go into more detail about the union of the Ba and the Ka. But the key um, with regard to that is that union. When they talk about the union of the Ba and the Ka, we're talking about the life force energy, the divine living energy that animates us and our consciousness. The heart and cardiovascular system the heart complex and the cardiovascular system, circulatory system, is the seat of the Ba, the divine living energy. And just like the blood is circulating, because of that, the divine living energy is circulating throughout your system, and you can direct that divine living energy in different ways. Primarily, your goal, as we said in the book, the Okra Okra Complex, is to activate with your energy source the specific configuration of energy you've been given to execute your function in creation. What that means is we have a specific function to execute in creation. That is wired within our spirit's brain, our kra, kra, our soul, divine consciousness. Just like your physical brain is wired and regulates the various organs and systems in your body. It has the blueprint. Direct everything. Make sure everything is running correctly. With your spirit, brain, the force that dwells in your head region, encoded within that force is the function you are to execute in the world. Why are you in the world? What is your purpose? What is your function? What is your life focus that is encoded within your spirit's brain, your ka, your kaet, your kra, your krawa? We call that function or divine, quote unquote, mission or life focus or purpose. In the Akan tradition is called Nkra and Nkrabiya. That's the male and female aspect of the function. What you are supposed to execute and the manner in which you are to execute. Are you, as we are cells within the great divine body of the supreme being, so what kind of cell are you? If you're an immune system cell, as we always say, then just like the immune system cells in your body, they have a specific function based on the system they are part of and they execute that function. If you're an immune system cell in the great divine body, then you have that function, you're going to be naturally inclined towards eradicating disorder, cancer within the community, wherever they are. You'll have a, a policing function, a military function, a martial type function to protect and defend the community. You're naturally inclined towards that kind of activity because it's wired within your crop. That's the uncra and uncrabia, the, the male and female aspect of your divine function. What you are to execute and the manner in which you must execute it so that you can fulfill that function without creating disorder in the process. But then you also have the shape and shibia. You don't just have the function and how you're to execute the function. You're also given a specific configuration of energy so that you can execute the function. If you need fiery energy, you're assigned fiery abosome, forces in nature that you can draw on their energy, utilize it, to execute that policing function. That is your sheh and shibia, that specific configuration of power, of energy that you've been given to execute your function, that supports your function, and the manner in which you utilize that energy. How do you turn it on? How do you turn it off? It's like somebody had a, a car that had a very powerful engine. Once they turn on that, that ignition and hit the accelerator, they need to know how to drive before the car shoots down the street. If they don't know how to steer it, they run off the road and run over buildings and everything else and cause all kinds of problems because it's a great deal of power and needs to be um, utilized properly. How do you turn it on? How do you turn it off? How do you open up that valve of energy? How do you shut it down? 
And when it's open, how do you utilize it properly to execute your function without creating disorder in the world in the process, without becoming excessive and self-destructive and so forth? So the she and the shebiya are in relation to the inkrabi. And this is why we show the picture of the brain as a, and its fourfold division. The cerebral cortex with the left and right hemispheres and then the cerebellum with the left and right hemisphere. The cerebral cortex being akin to the incra and incrabia, the specific function you are to execute in the world wired within the cerebral cortex. So therefore, if you're an immune system cell, that's wired within your cerebral cortex. You're supposed to, you came into the world to execute that policing function in the community, in a natural sense, not like the whites in our offspring. But then the cerebellum deals with motor movement and equilibrium and, and the use of power and so forth. So that's the she and shebia. How do you turn on the power? What kind of power do you have? Once you determine what kind of power you have, how do you utilize it? How do you open it up? How do you close it? How do you utilize it? And so forth so that you can fulfill the function you came into the world to execute without creating disorder in the world in the process. So that fourfold division of the brain find that same fourfold division in your spirit's brain, your crop. And crop and crop, yes, she and shebia all, all combined within the spirit's brain, the ka, the kaya. So once you find out, and because we come into the world with a specific configuration of energy inherited from the Patrick clan, Abosom, and the Matric clan, Abosom, in our common culture, the deity that governs the mother's clan, that has governed the mother's ancestresses and ancestors for thousands of years, that same divinity, energy, animated the ovum that became part of your body. And the Patrick land divinity, meaning the Abosom, the deity, that has protected and guided and empowered your father's clan for thousands of years, the energy of that force in nature animates his entire being, of course, all of his cells, but including his sperm cells as well. So that sperm cell that became half of your body, it was animated by the Petra clan on both sides that governs your father's clan for thousands of years. So you have a Matra clan on both sides and a Patrick clan on both sides that animate the sperm and ovum and they unite and become your body and the energy of those two divinities, one from the Matra clan, one from, from the Patrick clan, you have access to that energy. So as you grow and develop, in the womb and then you're born. You don't just have the DNA from your father and the DNA from your mother, and therefore you look like them and you have some of their characteristics, but the spiritual forces that animated the sperm cell and animated the old cell, you have access to them. You're directly linked. That's directly connected to your right and left hemisphere of your cerebellum, the she and the shebia. So you can access the patriclan divinity and utilize that energy for you know, protection and development and so forth and the metric land of entity and so forth. How do you turn it on and how do you turn it off? You learn that from the ancestresses and ancestors and from the divinities themselves. You learn that through ritual practice. When you engage in ritual practice, learn how to deal with that energy that's within you. It's like somebody learning martial arts and learn, or working out and so forth and learning how to deal with their own body and their own strength and power. The same thing with spiritual power. When you engage in ritual practice and learn how to open that capacity, then you use, utilize it to execute your function in creation. There are some people who become spiritually attuned even as children, spiritually open, sometimes very open. Some people are open enough, they're a little bit clairvoyant, they can see ancestresses and ancestors walking around, they can hear them or they can feel them or they can smell them and so forth, or they, they, their sense of balance is thrown off when an ancestral spirit or a divinity moves into the room and so forth, that they feel heat moving through their body when the spirit walks by. We have different capacities and so forth. Some people are open enough to experience things, but some people are so open that they become receptive to not only their own ancestors and ancestors, but other individuals that are unrelated as well. And if they don't know how to sanction that and repel those individuals, they can begin to negatively influence such individuals. And, of course, we have mechanisms to overcome that. We have ritual practices establishing the ancestral shrine and so forth, talismans and different things to deal with that. If you don't deal with that in a cultural fashion, then, of course, people will begin to 
labeled such individuals as schizophrenic and multiple personality disorder and lock them up in psych wars and give them medication and so forth because on one hand, the whites and offspring know that the individual is dealing with ancestral spirits, but they don't want them to know that because they like to oppress us and make us feel like there's something wrong with us. And they don't want us to communicate with our ancestors and ancestors. Um, but our people are being brainwashed. We go along with that nonsense. But when we understand our culture, of course, we know better. So some people have these capacities, but they don't know how to regulate them through ritual practice, through development, through exercising our responsibility, our obligation to op learn how to open and close these valves of energy and connect our own divine living energy to the creator and creatress. Our divine living energy moving through our, our body stimulates these forces within the physical brain and the spirit brain so that we can access that energy and utilize it harmoniously. This is what we're dealing with. The ba and the ba, the divine living energy surging through us, of course, surges through the brain just like the blood surges through all the organs in the body, but it also surges through the brain and it stimulates the brain. The spirit brain has that fourfold division. The bottom right and left hem hemisphere of the cerebellum is, are the seats, the shrines of the she and shebia, the energy of the, in reality, the energy of the patriclan abosom and the matriclan abosom connected there and so forth. That's major centers of that. So when divine living energy surges through that area and stimulates that area, then we can connect harmoniously with those forces in nature that were born with us, that have been governing our people for thousands of years, intergenerations. We have access to their energy through our ba, through our bayat, our obra, obra as we call it in our con, divine living energy within us, circulating through us, we can access and stimulate and activate the forces in nature that govern clan, our blood circles, and we can use that energy to execute our function in the world, to support our function harmoniously, and so forth. So before we go forward with regard to ritual practice, we just want to make sure um, we didn't miss it. If there are any questions in the chat room or online or on the phone line, hit the number one. Okay. All right, so just saw a couple of comments. I want to make sure we didn't miss anything before we go forward. There was one comment that says, as I understand it, the majority of black people have ka, kayat, that are semi-attached to our ba, bayat, because of misguided desires, pseudo-religions, and the infection of the spirits of disorder. The cure for us then is authentic ancestral communication. Um, what we would say is the majority of our people, they're Ka and Kayat, and what the poster is talking about, we've talked about this notion, and this is just true across the board, and we've dealt with this for thousands of years. Of course, the Ka, well, the Kayat dwells within the head region. It's the divinity, the force of nature that you experience, as we said, initially as a pull within your head towards proper behavior, thoughts, intentions, and actions. And if you go against that pull, you say, well, something told me I shouldn't have done that. I did it anyway, and then I suffered. Something told me I should have, you know, not have done that. And we experience that as children, as, as the ka, the ka, that's the force of nature. As you develop, you begin to communicate with that force. and no longer just a pull, but you can see that entity, that divinity will show itself to you, communicate directly with you, and so forth. We have shrines for the ka, shrines for the kaya in the Yoruba tradition, it's called the Ori, in Vodun it's called the Se, Lido, and Ibo it's called the Chi, and Akan it's called the Okra, Okrawa. So we have shrines for that so we can deal with that divinity on a consistent basis. We talked about washing the Kra, purification of the Kra ritually last week. So, but there's a notion of if you engage in consistent disorder, you reverse, quote unquote, your polarity, you make yourself repulsive the cry just like the magnet being repelled from the other magnet. And the cry can disengage from your head region and separate and become detached. If you persist deliberately in disorder, it will totally detach and return to Inyamewa Inyame and dissolve back into Inyamewa Inyame and you will no longer have a soul. Now you're a spirit without a soul. That is the nature of all of the white and offspring. And that cry will never return. So there's 
spirits without an anchor in divine order. This is why they're discordant and perverse, and they will continue to incarnate that in that manner because they are repulsive spirits. Most of our people haven't had that situation where the Ka has detached and separated. You must be engaged in some extreme behavior where it's detached and separated, gone. A small percentage of our people, it is, it is detached. Uh, most of our people, it's attached, but they're just neglecting it. So when, we, when you look in the book and it talks about neglect of the Akra near the end of the book, that whole section on the neglect, that's what our people are doing. We are ignoring the crowd guiding us on a regular basis, and we're ignoring the pull of the crowd. Why? Because another thought enters our mind. If we say we're going to deal with ancestral religion, for example, and we start reading something about that, and then all of a sudden we start getting scared and nervous and like, oh, well, that's demon worship, all that idiocy. That's just conditioning coming from the whites and our offspring, misinformation being flooded to us through the media and school and fake religious organizations like churches and mosques and more science temples and all kinds of nonsense um, and Hebrew nonsense. Um, so we end up neglecting what our cry is actually directing us to do. We'll just reject the direction, reject the inclination, reject the pull, reject the communication because of the nonsense we receive from the whites and our offspring. So the cry is still there. We're just neglecting it and it's no different than if you, you know inside, hey, I should be drinking water every day. Well, now I'm just going to drink this Coke, this Pepsi. And you keep doing that even though you know I, I really need to take care of myself. And you, you can say that for years and years and years. Your crowd telling you what you need to do and you're rejecting it because you're following your luck. And then, of course, you develop disease and obesity and all other kinds of diseases and so forth because you're neglecting what you're being told. That's the vast majority of our people. A smaller percentage, the crowd does detach because of some kind of behavior we're engaged in. And those people, if they don't do something ritually to realign with the crowd, then they're engaged in kinds of behavior that is labeled as paradigm, psychosis and so forth, schizophrenia, um, bipolar disorder, things like that. But that can be remedied as well. The people who just repel the crowd because of criminality then they become like the whites and offspring, their spirits of disorder. But as you said at the end of the um, comment, yes, through specifically dealing with realignment with the crop, like we talked about last week, that's the direct way to remedy that, of course. And then, of course, dealing with the ancestors and ancestors, the insamanfo, they will give you direction on how to engage those ritual practices and how they have in their, you know, in our blood circle, in a harmonious fashion. Okay, then there was another comment. Um, okay, saying that crackers have no bod, no cow, what animates their disease, bodies, and we mentioned that earlier, so the, the same electromagnetic energy that animates you know, the magnetic field for magnets and so forth, it's that same kind of energy, just by virtue of the fact that you're on Earth. It's like crack cocaine. It never existed before. The whites and their offspring bring it into existence through a perverse process. But it's on the planet, and it's therefore inside of the magnetos magnetosphere of Earth, the electromagnetic field that surrounds Earth. So it has some animation, even just at its root, with regard to you know, protons and neutrons and electrons and, you know, the movement um, of that atomic structure, those, those elements of the atomic structure, you, you're generating electromagnetic fields and that animation um, comes from that. But as far as aligning with forces in creation and other naturally created entities in a harmonious fashion, they're incapable of that. So they're operating no different than a car, a bus, or anything else. Okay, made I say for that. We appreciate appreciate that comment. Um, okay, and the other question in the chat room is, what does the spirit box do other than animate the body? So, 
that's the, the major major function is the divine living energy that animates us, right? So that we have animation. But the key is it's the energetic link within us. Just like we talked about the air and the atmosphere, we pull in a portion of that into our lungs and it animates us. So the air in our lungs is the direct link to the air that surrounds the planet. The divine living energy, the little bob bird within us, is, di- is our direct energy link to Ra and ra et, the creator and great dress, the divine living energy that permeates all of creation, including permeating the spirit of the various abosome in creation. So it's our direct energy link to all of the forces in creation, all of the plant life, animal life, mineral life, and other apurakani, apurakani, human life. So it's that divine energy link that allows us to connect with one another and feel that unity with one another as created entities and to be able to align with one another and live in harmony with one another. Think about um, when you see birds, for example, or schools of fish, and they're swimming, and then all of a sudden, they all turn at the same direction. Now, part of that, of course, they have magnetite in their brains, but they are spirits. They, they live in harmony with order. They live in harmony with nature. So they're aligned with one another. They feel one another, and they move in harmony with one another. The ba within us allows us to connect with the forces of nature, with plant life, animal life, mineral life, and the ancestors and ancestors and so forth, so we can align our energy with theirs and we can um, recognize and identify and realize and actualize our link our unity with one another. And so we can live in harmony with divine order. And when we get out of step, get off track, the ka, the kaya will direct us and inform us, hey, you're off track. You're making mistakes. This is what you need to do. But when we're off track, we can feel that we're off track. We can feel that we're out of harmony with divine order because the divine living energy that aligns us, we're out of alignment with that. And we can feel that just like, that man- magnet can feel the repulsion of the other magnet. You can feel it when you're out of alignment with plant life or animal life or mineral life or your significant other or your children, family, other Apurakani, Apurakani people, um, the forces in nature, the ancestors and ancestors. You can experience that disalignment because you have a ba and by it and it's moving in one direction, you're moving in the other. So you can experience that. And that's critical because then once you experience, you won't, you want to get in alignment. So it's like a pain center in your brain that is very critical because once you put your hand on a hot stove or something, automatically your pain center sends the signal to stimulate your nerves so you can feel that pain. It's, it's you know, stimulated so you can snatch your hand off. If you didn't have that pain center, the capacity to feel um, that pain, then you wouldn't know anything is wrong. You may leave your hand on the stove until it burns all the way through your you know, bone before you start smelling something and saying, hey, there's something cooking. So the fact that you can experience and align with the other forces in creation and other created entities in creation, that's key. You're going to tune to, you know, thoughts, intentions, and actions in a harmonious way with other individuals and entities, just like animals can communicate with one another and so forth. Um, but you can also recognize when you're out of harmony so that you know it's time to get back in harmony. All right, so let us know if that um, answers the question. A comment, um, I believe what animates the crack is some low-level energy with no spiritual anchor, anchor at all. We're, exactly, that's correct. So, all right, so we want to get into um, a couple of things here. First, if you look at the if you look at the Patasasatim, and we'll put the link back in there. Patasasatim is one of our books. It's an educational curriculum uh, with seven modules for youth and adults, um, and we go go into a number of different things in this book, dealing with culture, dealing with ma- um, morality, dealing with uh, melanin, dealing with um, decision-making, dealing with ethical existence. We also deal with responsibility, asedie, and this is what we're going we're gonna to touch on this. We've talked about it in previous broadcasts, the specific angle here, dealing with asedie or responsibility is directly related to 
this notion of the in spirit, the energy that we have when we talk about the in spirit through discipline so that we can utilize the divine living energy within us. We have the obligation to in spirit that energy and through discipline to execute our function in creation. It's not an option, it's our obligation. Our obligation to in spirit that power is our obligation to utilize discipline. It's not afurakani, afuraikaiti, to be undisciplined. It's not natural, that's childish. So, and people probably have experienced some individual, and they claim to be involved in ancestral religious practice, claim to be involved in ancestral culture, and typically they're just engaged in misguided intellectualism where they participate in a few little rituals and think that they're covered just because you attend a couple of rituals or give some offerings or you play some drums or dance or uh, ancestral spirit possesses you maybe a lower level, uncultivated ancestral spirit, or you have a few dreams or some clairvoyance, you think you're covered because you're doing this, but you're engaged in debauchery, you're promis- promiscuous and you're utilizing drugs and alcohol and you know, foul behavior, foul language, all kinds of self-destructive things, and you've learned to intellectualize that nonsense and think that you're covered because you do a few little rituals here and there and you're undisciplined, you know, a glutton and so forth, and you think that you're engaged in, you know, ancestral religious practice. Ancestral religious practice is life in reality. The term ba. By it, divine living energy, ba, when we talked about the, remember we had a broadcast, and they, the sounds of the abosom, the nature of their birth. Name. We talked about how do these words come into existence, where do they come from? When we talk about ba, meaning life, it has to mean that because that's the sound that the explosion of life makes when it moves through creation. When Ra and Riot explode into, onto the scene through that fire and light energy that explodes from the substance of space. They're the first fire and light that explodes, and Ba explodes into, into existence. This is where the Ba comes from. This is why offspring is Ba. When they come forth and burst forth from the, ro- the, the womb, the of Ba, which is the offspring. That's the term for offspring. Ba meaning divine life, living energy. Ba in our kind meaning to come forth. And of course, Oba meaning female and Oba me meaning male are rooted in that life principle. The energy that the spirit makes when it explodes forward and comes forward is Ba. And this is why we replicate that sound that the spirit makes. We vo- replicate that with our vocal cords to approximate that um, energy. And we say Ba. So you have divine living energy within you that life energy that's animating all of creation. Creation is a harmonious creation. Plant life lives in harmony with divine order. Animal life lives in harmony with divine order. Mineral life lives in harmony with divine order. So what do we look like thinking that we don't have the responsibility or the obligation to live in harmony with divine order? And being gluttonous is not living in harmony with divine order. Being promiscuous is not living in harmony with divine order. Engaging in self-destructive activities is not being in harmony with divine order. And the intellectualizing of that idiocy comes directly from the spirits of disorder, the whites and offspring. It has nothing to do with us. We have a function to execute in the world. That's why we are alive. The cells in your body don't decide, well, I'm not going to be a heart cell anymore. I'm tired of being, you know, locked into that position. I want to do something else with my life, and they just start trying to do whatever they want to do. You have a system that's wired within you. It is your responsibility and obligation to align yourself with that function, your thoughts, intentions, and actions on a moment-to-moment basis throughout the course of your life. That's maturity. If you do not, you're going to create disorder within your life in the process. But if you align with that function, that is the only time you experience what is described as happiness, described as joy, described as peace, described as balance, and so forth, all those things are just descriptive of the alignment of your spirit with your soul, alignment of your spirit, body, your sum sum, through the ba, with the ka, the kayak, 
the bi and bias being aligned with the chi and chi, and you constantly engage in that process, then you experience harmony, you experience order, and that could be described as beauty, described as peace, described as balance, described as a number of different things. The only time you achieve that is when you align yourself moment to moment with your crop, because what's encoded within your crop is the function that Inyame wa Inyame, the Supreme Being, gave you to execute in the world. If you do not align with that or seek to align with that, that's when you experience not only, you know, quote unquote, as we talked about before, depression, sadness, all these different things. Those are just at the root expressions of disalignment from the crop. So, of course, the key to overcoming those things is alignment with the crop because the crop is a divinity. So, there's, as we said earlier in the past, there's no depression or anxiety or fear or all that nonsense in the crop, in the divinity of force in nature. That's repulsive to that divinity. It's also repulsive to your ba, your ba, your divine living energy that only operates in harmony with divine order. So when we try to circumvent the movement of the ba, the divine living energy within us, that, that bird that we direct to move and carry us and animate us, you know, to do what we need to do, if we try to utilize that energy to do something corrupt, that little bird that's flying through us, that divine living energy will not participate and link up energetically with the forces of nature to assist us in debauchery, it will cut itself off from us. And once it cut it cuts itself off from us, then the only energy we have left over to engage in our criminality or our, our lust and so forth is simply lower level residual electromagnetic energy, just like the white snarl spring, or just like the uh, remote control car or something like that. But the divine living energy of the ba, that little bird that you see watching the weighing of the heart, that little force in nature, that child of rod and right that dwells within your heart and lung complex region and flies throughout your system, it will not generate any energy to assist you in debauchery. It will not generate energy to assist you in gluttony. It will not generate energy to assist you in sexual deviance or anything else or criminality or, or intellectualizing stupidity. It will cut itself off from you, and then the only thing you will have left, as we said, is lower-level electromagnetic energy. So we have an obligation to execute the function we came into the world to execute. That is our obligation as responsible adults. When we begin teaching our children that from the time we're children, and they take it on in a major way when they go through manhood and womanhood training. So on the page, um, if you look at page 30 in the Patas of Tim, says asedia responsibility. We have seven principal value aspects of asedia responsibility based on the abosom that govern the seven days of the week, that holistic cycle that governs all natural cycles. Um, we talk about sleep, regeneration, which is adai, the asedia or responsibility or that obligation to regenerate ourselves. The next one is diet, drian, eating properly, feeding ourselves, stimulating ourselves, fueling ourselves so that we can move forward in a harmonious fashion. Ahuadeng, which is strength, power, dealing with exercise. These first three are the physical asedi or responsibility. Then susu, which means to reflect, meditation or study. That's the next asedi, refine, tree, which means to refine, to polish, to refine. We have the capacity, once we susu and reflect on ourselves, reflect on our functioning creation, reflect on the capacities we've been given through that asedi or responsibility or obligation to engage susu or reflection, and we know who we are and we know what our capacities are, then we have the responsibility to engage in tree, which means to refine, refine our talents, refine our energy capacity, learn how to utilize them. The next um, step is to boss to build, utilize the energy, the capacity we have to build and establish what we need to establish in our lives based on our, our functioning creation. And then the final piece is chere chere, which means to teach, to explain, to be able to explicate the nature of our functioning in society to our children, to other people in society, and also the ancestral protocol so that people can respect what we have built, maintain what we have built, and the ancestral protocols that put that into place. So all of those things you'll find, when we detail that in this section, 
on assedie, on responsibility. And that gives you a, a foundation to understand that we're not talking, this is not some people just sitting around intellectualizing and being all kinds of sexual deviants and gluttons and everything else, and they do a few rituals and everything straight, and they sit around smoking cigarettes and, and, and cigars and drinking alcohol and talking about their priests and a priestess and their gluttons and everything else and, and, you know, making perverse comments to the women and everything else, but they're, they're claiming to be somebody um, engaged in spirituality. That's nonsensical. They're no different than T.D. Jakes or Creflo Dollar or other idiots like that, controlled by lust and very often mouth. We have a responsibility just like plant life, animal life, and mineral life to live in harmony with creation. We have a natural inclination towards that. So we go into detail about those obligations in that section on asedia or responsibility. Now we want to get to the abua and kwa section because in that section we deal with one of the aspects of how to utilize our energy and, and uh, regulate it in a ritual fashion. We did a, an entire broadcast on abua and kwa, so we're just going to deal with it from this specific angle so you can see this is just one means of engaging this process. Uh, first, we're going to have, so we'll put the link. The link is in the chat room. Let me go back up and, uh, okay, we're going to put the link to Abu Ankwa in the chat room again. And then we're going to, um, real quick, we've got a call on the phone line. We're going to take the call and then we're going to get into the Abu Ankwa ritual, ritual movement for health and wellness and so forth. All right. Okay, Michiowo, on the phone line, number 9123. You had a question or a comment? Uh, Nichamo, Brother Ojita Flo. This is uh, Brother Al. I'm calling from North Carolina. Um, whew. Yeah, yeah. Brother, this work is is next level. I just wanted to um, have – I had a comment um, briefly about the uh, okra and – how I've seen that just personally manifest in my life. Um, I was born on Thursday. Um, so, um, you know, I, from my understanding, that's uh, Yao, Yauda, Ya, correct? Right, right. Hello? Okay. So um, as a child, I always had this interest in tornadoes coming up. I constantly was researching, you know, in elementary school and on up. I was always interested in tornadoes and so on and so forth. And I saw how you aligned the, um, you know, that the deity of Yao with uh, Oya and Wachet. And so even now I have recurring dreams over and over and over and over about tornadoes constantly, you know, ripping through towns and, you know, things of that nature. You know, and but I didn't make the alignment until I began to study the information. And so I watched one of your videos dealing with Wachet, and this was after me trying to get an understanding of certain readings I had gotten as to my purpose in the world. And what came up in the readings was um, Wachet. For it, Wachet kept showing up as far as my career, as well as my purpose in life, as well as what I need to be focused on as far as this year is concerned. And I began to align it all up with the dreams that I would constantly have since my, I'm 36 now, but I would have these dreams since I was in my twenties. And I was also as a child, just very interested in, you know, the, the, the force of nature as it, you know, expresses itself as wind. And when I began to hear you do like a very thorough breakdown of one of your shows, it just resonated with me so much so that I began to understand how I was actually out of line times where I had been in line and other moments where I had been out of line and how so many groups, um, like what you speak about, teach about unconditional love and not dealing with the aspect of hate. And I realized that I had been too accept, I would be accepting and in, in doing what is right, but not rejecting what is wrong. So, you know, when you talk about the protectress of royal sovereignty and just seeing how that aligns with my energy, I see now, you know what I'm saying? very clearly what the purpose is now and just li listening to the shows and internalizing the information is like make, causing overnight changes for me personally 
you know what I'm saying? So I just wanted to share that because I've, I've, it's been going on all my life, and the signs have always been there in the various ways, forms, and fashions. But to actually get a hold of the information and it, you know, is is just phenomenal. But not like you said, not just from an intellectual place, but from like it's like real, true to life. And so I'm just a living witness of what it is that you're speaking about. I just want to share that and say thank you. Uh, no, Mayor, I say we appreciate that because that's, that's a perfect example of it, it's real life. It's not like, and like you said, it's not you didn't just decide to intellectualize studying tornado. <laughs> this, this, you know, you came into the world, you know, dealing with that, and that, you know, none of y'all as well as y'all, you know, working with you. So you had to find out, you know, what's going on. You want to, to align with the force that governs you. And then you notice the differences between when you were out of alignment and now you can see some the information that we put forward is simply confirming because you were born with these divinities. Nobody can give them to you at a ceremony. Even somebody can give you a pot and they can give you whatever they want. But you came into the world, you incarnated with these forces in nature connected with you. And that's a perfect example of being able to, you know, through everything you went through, you still were able to hold on to that thread of, okay, authenticity, something is, you know, missing, but I know I'm on the right track. And you finally got to the point where the information that you received simply confirms what's already within you. And when you have, you know, accurate information, it should simply comport with what's already inside of your trial. It shouldn't be something that's going in, you know, contravention to what's inside of you. It should be going in contravention to what your insamampu, your ancestors and ancestors are directing you towards. It should be confirming what that what you were born with, and that's a perfect example. So we appreciate that. Absolutely, absolutely, Medase. Okay, yeah, yeah, I'll say that. Okay. Um. And I see we had a, there was another comment in the chat room. Uh, it says, I don't know what my Mkrabiya is yet. I just found out I'm connected to Ajua and have always been drawn to healing, but until I know for sure what do I do in the meantime, I'm at the end of my 30s, so I feel an urgency. Okay, so check out the broadcast on not not last week, but the week before last when we talked about Mkomre, Ancestral Shrine Communication, and Liberation. So we always recommend that people begin to establish, consciously establish a strong connection with your direct ancestresses and ancestors of your blood circle, those spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors of your blood circle. And I know in some awful so. In that broadcast, we talk about an establishing an ancestor shrine when you don't know the specific ethnic group from which you have incarnated. And we talk about, of course, we incarnate from specific groups. So you, we've lived in the world before as part of these groups. Through the Musuo Kesi, the great perversity and enslavement, we you know, went through a number of different things, and we've reincarnated through our descendants, and we have come back through Bebra or rebirth, reincarnation, the blood has been mixed, but the soul is not mixed. The individual who was part of whatever ethnic group we were part of, we've returned. Our phenotypes are slightly different. Our morphology is slightly different. Our skins may be a little bit lighter brown because of violence that took place in the ancestral blood circle, but we're still melanin dominant, and we still have the same kra, krawa, as well as the same spirit, bra and brawa that we had when we were here in the past. So we're the same people, and you can find that out. But if you don't know right at this moment, you can always use the language of ancient Kanat Kemet to invoke your ancestors as an ancestor because that's the parent language of the various languages on the continent from which and groups from which we come. So you can always use that parent language and your ancestors as an ancestors from ancient Kanat, Nubia Kemet, as well as your most recent, will direct you to exactly who you are. So you can establish a shrine and when you say your prayer and engage in ritual practice, we we have that information including ritual prayer translations and so forth in the language of ancient Kemet so that you can engage that process. So we we always say with stars there. 
So check out the Kumre Ancestral Shrine Communication uh, broadcast that we did the week before last, Monday or Jordan before last, Akanto Nanasom broadcast before last. And we also saved it as a YouTube video as well. Um, so you can check it on the YouTube page, OG Duffo YouTube channel as well. All right. Okay, so let us go to the... Um, We're going to go to the uh, Aboa and Kwa page, and this will give you an example of what we're talking about with regard to ritual practice. Now, in the section dealing with asedie or responsibility, um, for example, let, let's get a, give a quick example there. So the fourth asedie, fourth responsibility, we said the asedie of meditation or study, which is susu, calls for focused observation. Meditation is the ritual is a ritual means by which we redirect the focus of our consciousness. We direct the focus of our consciousness to our unkra and prabia. We learn what our function in life is, and we direct the focus of our consciousness to the unique structure of our spirit. We learn the specific means by which we must develop our spiritual capacity, potential, and talent. Awareness and intuition, receptivity and retention, defensive and offensive power, intellect, judgment, creativity, wisdom. When we engage in focused observation of things, entities, or events in the world, we learn how the various things, entities, and or events could positively or negatively inform and influence our expression of our talents in life. And once we learn that, the next one, as we said, is the asedia to refine the imperative to perfect our craft or our capacity. And then the next is asedia to build, utilize the energy we've been given to fully develop our refined talent, express the nature of our inkra and inkrabiyas through divinely ordered action. And then we have the asedia to explain clear articulation of the nature and function of, of our work, our life's work. It establishes its value and the value of adhering to the Nkra and Krabia within the consciousness of Afurakani, Afurakani population. So starting off with that ritual practice, um, on first, the three physical asedia, sleep regeneration, diet, and exercise, and then moving into the ritual practices, which those are ritual practices as well in reality. Um, but then moving towards um, susu, susu home meditation, study focused observation, through that process, um, attuning to the structure of our spirit, there are different forms of susu or reflection. You can engage in ritual song, you can engage in ritual dance, you can engage in uh, ritual prayer, you can engage in ritual movement, you can engage in a number of different ritual practices. Um, we're going to talk about one in particular so you can, give an, you can give an example of what we're dealing with. Through ritual song, you Utilize sound vibration to stimulate your ba, your ba, at your divine living energy. And once it's stimulated, it, it, you know, if the energy is, is expanded, then you can direct that energy to support your function and creation. If you engage in ritual prayer, through that ritual process, you stimulate the ba, divine living energy. Once that energy is open and expanded, you can direct that energy to support your function and creation. If you engage in um, ritual uh, dance, it's the same process. Here, Abu Ankwa, we have a uh, practice actually developed here in the Western Hemisphere by Akwamo Mind, the Akwamo Nation in North America, in connection with Fanti Mind, the Fanti Nation in North America. And we talk about that on the website. We have a link to our pages and so forth. Developed under the guidance of our Nanano Nsamampo, spiritually cultivated. Akan ancestresses and ancestors, and the Abosom, the forces in nature, different ritual movements connected to our Achinebwa, our animal totem. So just like you engage in ritual song or ritual dance, for example, you'll see people engage in ritual dance um, in the forms of certain animals and so forth. Um, in the same fashion, when we engage in certain size movements or moving our bodies in, the, in front of the shrines and so forth, in the forms of our animal totems that are connected to our blood circles, then we stimulate the energy of those animal totems, just like we are 
children of certain divinities. You have plant life, animal life, mineral life, and then apurakani, apurakani, human life, categorized according to certain forces in nature. So a certain force in nature is the sacred animal, maybe the antelope, the otwe. They may have certain foods that are sacred to them. They may have certain achiwadi or taboos that are associated with them and so forth. And certain people are children of those divinities. It's because all of us, plant life, animal life, mineral life, and the afurakani, afurakani, human in that class are all categorized under that energy because we carry the energy of that force of nature. So we're all, quote, unquote, children of that divinity. And the plants, animals, and the minerals are like our, quote, unquote, brothers and sisters under that class. So we utilize those plants or utilize those minerals, or we call on those animal totems that are both some will send that animal totem to us when they're trying to communicate with us. Whatever animal is associated with them and carries their energy, they'll send that animal. Kataru can send a falcon or a hawk to send a message of warning to you or to let you attune to something. There are also ancestral totems for ancestral clans. So, for example, the Kwa Kwa Debi, the white crested raven or the crow, like the black crow in, in North America, that is the Achinebwa or the animal totem for the Asona, Abusia, the Asona clan and Akan culture. So, those of us who are of the Asona Abusia, the Nanano Unsumampa will send that black crow, that Kwa Dabi, in our sphere of awareness, in front of our car, in front of us somewhere to begin to call at us when they're sending a message of admonition or confirming something for us or a number of different things. So the ancestors and ancestors, there are animal totems associated with clan, just like there are animal totems associated with um, di different divinities of which we are children. So therefore, when we move in the same form of those divinities or those animal totems, they carry that energy. So we stimulate the energy of the force in nature by moving our bodies in those forms in a ritual fashion. So when you see the Aboa on Kwa page, first we explain the terms Aboa, meaning animal, and Nkwa is the term Onk from ancient Kemet. It's Nkwa and Akan, it means life. Of course, in ancient Kemet, Onk also means life. Aboa in Akan means animal. Abau in ancient Kemet means animal. So they're the same terms. We show the Medutu for that. We prove that, of course. We show the Onk as well as the Okwa doll, the fertility doll in our common culture is the same Onk doll in ancient, from ancient Kemet. Um, and of course, we have our book. Ankh, the origin of the term yoga, and kata, kasa, the origin and nature of the chakra, chakra where we prove in, in, you know, irrefutably and conclusively that the term yoga comes from the term, or yoke, or yoke comes from ankh, from ancient Kemet. We prove that in the term kakara comes from kara, kara, in ancient Kemet. We show the medutu for that, and we show the same terms in the Akan tradition, the term kasa in ancient Kemet, meaning a knot, also dealing with the spine, the seven knots on the spine, also the seven sanctuaries on the spine. It also means those who communicate, spirits who communicate and so forth. And that's why the term kasa also means to communicate in Akan culture and so forth. So we prove all of that. We show the Medusa for all of that in the book, um, showing, and showing what, what off really means. So this notion of what yoga is coming from the white and offspring, first of all, it's not a Sanskrit term. Second of all, what they put forward with regards to what it is is not what it is. They've just created a pseudo-discipline of sitting down and meditating on the abyss and moving to some little postures um, that has no basis in spirituality in reality, undergirded by a pseudo-philosophy. When our people sit in front of the ancestral shrine, which we've done for thousands of years. We pour libation and give a food offering to the ancestors and ancestors or the abosom. Sit, once we invoke them or evoke them and they come forward, we sit down and communicate with them. Just like if you called your grandparents over to your house, they come into the house and sit down. You give them some food, give them something to drink. They eat the food, they drink, then you sit down after they are there, so that you can learn something from them. So when we give food and we give drink and so forth at the ancestral shrine and invoke them through ritual song or ritual dance, they come forward and take up a residence. Now they have our attention. 
then we sit down and learn from them. So when we're sitting in front of the tribe after the invocatory ritual process and evocatory ritual process, then we learn directly from them. We ask things, we learn things, as well as whether it's learning to heal something or connect with someone or learn what we should be doing, what we shouldn't be doing, the nature of certain things, whether it's science or mathematics, whatever it is, we learn things, get direction, get guidance, and also get empowered ritually, stimulating that empowered, that energy. And then once we learn what we need to learn, get what we need to get, then we move forward and execute our functioning creation in a harmonious fashion based on what we've learned from the abosa. Sometimes when a different abosom will come forward, of course, then nature comes forward at the shrine or ancestral spirit comes forward at the shrine. When the, the mouth goes, the energy itself requires us, just by nature of the force, to switch and move in a different position so we can fully and optimally receive the energy of that divinity. If you move your arm up or hold your arm up or hold your leg up or do just like different dance movements, the way your blood moves in your body is different. We have different dance movements that allows us to receive and transmit energy in different ways. It's like someone doing martial arts, you move your arms and move your legs, you're wielding the energy within your body in, in various forms. We have different dance forms for moving and wielding energy in different forms, whether it's slow forms or moving faster or whatever. So when we engage that process of ritual dance or in a slower ritual movement, moving in different positions opens up valves of energy for us. So if different divinity comes forward, we're, we're naturally inclined and moved by the force of nature to shift position. That's a response to the Abosom who have come forward. The whites and offspring saw it sitting in front of shrines and moving into different positions and sitting there for different periods, and they're like, oh, we can, just, we can sit down and and with our legs crossed like this or our knees up or our arms up, and we can do the same thing. So they're just imitating something, but they're not communicating with anything. It's like if somebody saw you talking on a cell phone, they never saw a cell phone before, they just see you with a piece of plastic and speaking into the plastic and laughing and talking. So they say, oh, I can do that, and they go get a piece of plastic and they put it through their ear and they start talking and laughing as well. But you're connected to someone and you're responding to someone, and they are not. So that's the difference. So they don't know what onk or onk, uh, which they've corrupted into yonk, yonka or yoga, they have no capacity to understand what that is because they can't communicate with the Ntumapo or the Abosa. Um, for those who would like to listen beyond 11 o'clock, you have about a minute to call in. Um, the call in number is 657-383-0635, because after 11 o'clock it will cut off online, but the people on the phone will be able to continue to listen. So six five seven three eight three zero six three five. You have about a half a minute to call in, um, and we won't go on too much longer beyond eleven o'clock. We just want to finish this section. Um, so let me get back to that section. So this is what is going on. So we detail that in the book, but the ritual movements we're dealing with with regard to Abua and Kwa is rooted in other various major ancestral totems, Achinebwa, which are connected to Afurakani, Afurakani people, thousands of years, over the course of thousands of years, of course, we've been dealing with these animal totems. So we move our bodies in these ritual um, formations in connection with these animal totems. And when we do so, it not only strengthens our bodies um, through strengthening, stretching, toning, balancing, defense, offense, and focus. So what you're doing when you're switching and moving and so forth, you're stimulating the ba, the ba at within you. You're wielding that power. Every movement wields power. It's like if you swung at somebody and they can feel the wind of your, you know, arm moving by them. But the electromagnetic energy moving through your nervous system, they can feel that as well. That's that residual energy. But then if of course, it's Afurakani, Afurakani people. We have a ba, a ba is a divine living energy. So every movement wields energy. So our movements are purposeful. We're moving faster or moving slower. We're stimulating some fiery energy or, or watery energy or cool, earthy energy or whatever it is. And then specific formations connect us to certain forces in nature and ancestral totems that actually replenish our own spirit body. 
replenish our own energy, stimulate us, and realign us, help us to clear blockages from our awareness. So this is what we're dealing with with the Aboa and Kwa. And this is why we have that. So I just want to make sure we didn't miss anything in the chat room real quick. Uh, okay. So we're going to the section in the Aboa and Kwa. I want to scroll down real quick on the page. Give us a second real quick. I just want to find this this point. Okay. So as we're explaining that, and it's just one, again, it's one possibility. There's also a ritual song, and you'll find that in the our book, the Ubin Shang, the Ancestral Summons, ritual song, ritual dance, ritual prayer. Of course, this is ritual movement different ways to stimulate the energy within us, to bother by it within us, link it to the forces in nature through ritual practice so that we can be replenished, so that we can move forward and support the function that we are assigned to, you know, to execute in creation. Um, when we're explaining aboa and kwa, we say the medutu or hieroglyphs of the term, term animal, which is abau in ancient Kemet, are related to the terms for heart, ab, Dan, ab, and thirst or desire, ab, ab. The heart is what animates us in unceasingly sending moja or blood and energy to the body through its unceasing palpitation. Its rhythmic movement is the basis of dance, which is ab. So the heart is ab, dance, ab, and ancient commit, and the desire, ab, to function harmoniously, rhythmically in every assay in the world. According to our nature's Afurakani, Afurakani people, it is important to note that the determinative meduta symbol for thirst or desire, ab, is that of an animal, abau, in motion, animated. So we show the medutu, the term abau, meaning animal, ab, meaning heart, ab, meaning to dance, ab, meaning thirst, and so forth, desire, to move in harmony with divine order. And then we talk about the, we show the hieroglyphs for the term ankh, which means life, but the term ankh also means an animal. And the animal itself is wearing a um, symbol around the neck in the form of an ankh. That ankh around the neck of the animal, we show the image there, is the ankh or the yonk or the yoke around the neck of the animal. It's the association of the term ankh with yonk or yoke. Proto-Indo-European language phylum, yonk or eunuch, it comes directly from off from ancient Kemet. And then eunuch or yonk or yoke in English and yoka in, you know, Sanskrit and so forth, this is where these terms come from. Um, so what we say here is, I'm going to scroll up real quick. Aboa Nkwa is a ritual means by which we animate our life force and life focus by using our bodies as instruments to align with our achinebwa animal totems. Our achinebwa or animal totems are inherited by blood directly from our patrilineal and matrilineal blood circles and ultimately from our nananum insumampo ancestresses and ancestors who first experienced a calm spirit possession by those abosom deities who govern the sacred animals comprising the various achinebwa. Only Afurakanu, Afurakaitnut Africans, black people have authentic achinebwa animal totems, and all of us, of course, have that because we're all connected to forces in nature, and all of them have animals who are sacred to. It's a means by, abua and kwa is a means by which we move the body in the forms of our ancestral achinebwa in order to invoke the abosom, the forces in nature. Abua and kwa supports our physical health, ahuaden, and spiritual balance, adene, as we work to align and realign with our Okra, Okrawa, soul, divine consciousness. The Okra, Okrawa are the male and female terms for soul, divine consciousness. We mentioned that, and we've talked about that, but the Abu Ankwa allows us to align our physical bodies with our Okra, Okrawa, through the Achinebwa for strengthening, stretching, toning, balancing, defense, offense, and focus. The results of this alignment can be transferred to all other um, areas of life. And then we show a, a chart of the major 
animal totems that we deal with in that ritual practice. And as we said, we will post some videos of that ritual practice, but the key is we show that page just as an example, but various ritual practices that we engage in, whether it's ritual song, ritual dance, ritual prayer, meditation, ritual movement, um, these different activities, they're all focus on the reality that we have divine living energy animating us. We direct that divine living energy to support our function in creation. So that energy is replenished by the forces in nature, and then we're guided by our, for our ancestors and ancestors on how to um, utilize that energy for our benefit. Okay, so we want to... Um, there's a question in the, on the phone line. Um, we're going to take that call right quick. Michiavo on the phone line. You had a question or a comment? Um, my question, uh, I mean, Jamal, my question um, I have to ask is, and we um, there was, like you said from last week's show about homosexual and dissexuality. There, I found a, a, a what they call it, a um, documentary or a blog that talks about the people that fund it, and you know what I'm saying? Most of our people that, because they're not understand economics, when they deal with their own money, that it's the economics that they pay back to the Archibald folks, it is stated in the same, um, I think, blog that says these are the same taxpayers, all, any type of money that we, you know, use for our own benefit, it goes into these so called institutions to fund these, um, perverts and faggots in regards to taking our boys and you know and train them in, in the benefits of this sickness. You know. So the reason I brought it up because, you know, it, it goes in what you went in last week and trying to say our people have to be more more cognizant about this is much more deeper than expected, you know. And times now if the culture's not put in there and understand what you do with your money, I think they the the enemy does use this for the betterment for his own will to for our own destruction. And I don't know if you want to share on that why this state. No, we appreciate that, yes. Um that's you know, this is the work of the White Snarls friend to always figure out various ways to promote debauchery, to promote disorder on every level. So that's their nature as spirits of disorder. And just and to tie that in to, um, you know, what we're talking about tonight the, with regard to the ba and the bias, the way to impact and overcome those things, just like we were talking about people who have been rising up lately, when you, number one, align with your function and creation, then you're aligning with divine order. We're spirits of order. We have a function to execute. We're ourselves within the great divine body of the supreme being, so we have our roles to execute. So it's one thing to know that you have a function. Some people know just in general, yeah, I have a purpose. I don't know what my purpose is. But then some people find out what their purpose is. And this is where you get to some individuals, for example, who have been engaged in that such religious practice. They may have gotten some divination from priests or priestess or something or learned something from the Arbosom, learned from, from the Untamafo and so forth, that not only that they have a function, but what their function is. But then the next piece is, that's again, that's dealing with the uncra and crabia, like the cerebral cortex, the right, right and left hemisphere, knowing what your function is, the manner in which you must execute that function so you don't create disorder in the world in the process while you're executing your function. That's the knowledge of what that function is, your nature. But then the cerebellum, the left and right hemispheres of the cerebellum build with power and movement and the equilibrium and wielding power. You have power that you must utilize to fulfill that function, and you must refine that and learn how to utilize it and actually engage in the process of utilizing it. So it's one thing to know who you are and have some knowledge and what our bosom govern you and things like that. But if you don't, do not use the power that you've been given, number one, to fully expand it and then utilize it to execute your function, you're still engaged in disorder because you're not executing your function. 
It's not enough to know something about the Orisha, something about the Abosom, sit around and talk about that, do a little offering every now and then, but you do not engage that whole constellation of Asedie responsibilities, as we talked about, to actually engage in life in a harmonious fashion, meaning you have to align with your Ba, your Ba as your divine living energy, utilize that energy to be replenished and execute your function and support that function on a consistent basis. When we do that, then we empower ourselves through that divine living energy. We empower ourselves to engage our function, to overcome our obstacles, to remove all obstacles in our path, physical and non-physical, discarnate and carnate, including the white snarl spring, the Negroes who would work on behalf of the white snarl spring to oppress us. So we have the power to overcome our enemy, the white snarl spring, their fake culture, fake religion, their perversity. We have the power to overcome all of that, but we have to access the power we have incarnated with and utilize it in a harmonious fashion, or else we're just like a paraphilegia. A paraphilegia can look all around the room, they can study, they can read, they can talk all about, they can study, they can become a PhD in um, study the study of martial arts, for example. That's knowledge, but then they can't move and they can't fight. So you can sit around and study and learn a whole lot of things. That's dealing with the okra, okrawa, attuning to what's going on. But if you do not stimulate that divine living energy within you and utilize it to support the divine function, then you're just a spiritual paraphilia. So once we get out of that, you know, paralysis, then we can not only recognize what the enemy is doing, we can overcome and eradicate the enemy. Divine order, of course, is comprised of divine law, love, and divine hate. We incorporate law through acceptance of order, and we execute divine hate through the rejection of disorder. So when we understand divine law and divine hate, two complementary poles of divine order, then we utilize our energy and our consciousness to support that fully. So that that directly ties into what you were saying with regard to the way they're utilizing all kinds of methods to oppress our people, and they will only be able to continue, but we'll stop that once we awaken. And that's the value of Nanasam, Akurakani, Akurakadi, the ancestral religion, no matter what expression it takes, authentic expression, is the ritual incorporation of divine law and the ritual restoration of divine balance. And that is predicated upon us aligning with our Okra, Okrawa, as well as our Obra, Obrawa, our Ka and Kaet, our Ba and Baet. Indeed. Um, if you like, I, I'll share that, that link either on your page or on the um, main website for further reading. Okay. But that's okay. All right. But that's okay, we appreciate you. that. Yeah. Any other that. Okay, and it looks like we might have one more call on the line before we sign off. Uh, Michiowo, number 9123, did you have a question or a comment on the line? Yeah, yeah, I spoke to you uh, just a, a little while back earlier in the show, but you just said something about divine, the divine movements and um, strengthening, tonifying the body and whatnot and, you know, taking the, the ritual, the spiritual approach to it. And it just made me think about um, – the the culture of like the gym, fitness centers and whatnot, and how where I'm from, I know what's going on everywhere else. I see like a lot of sisters and brothers, but I'm really seeing like a lot of sisters who are trying to like get into shape and you know kind of change their, their 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 fitness habits and whatnot. But I don't really I don't really see like any major changes like any noticeable. Changes. I see a lot of women walking around um, walls and um, going into the gym, trying to do all types of exercises, and it seems like it's doing more harm so often than good. And so, you know, when you were explaining what you were just explaining, I thought about that because a lot of times when I'm in the gym working out, I have to also monitor how I'm working out, like in what spirit am I actually coming in to do this workout? Am I surrounded by people that I don't need to be around? Um, I'm looking at the sisters who are in the place, and it seems like they're doing movements that are just very awkward and not in tune with, you know, their their natural movements, like their nature. 
And, you know, I'm seeing it like so often, if you don't know what you're doing, it can do more harm than good. But then overall, it would be best to take on the type of exercise and fitness regimens that do incorporate the ritual um, um, practices. You know what I'm saying? So I just wanted to, you know, speak on that, but I also wanted you to kind of like res- um, respond to that because I'm seeing it as a craze right now where everybody's buying the spandex and the, you know, the workout clothing and the shoes and spending a whole lot of money, but, you know, there's like really no true satisfaction as far as the spiritual growth or the physical, you know, fortitude, you know what I'm saying? So I just want to elaborate on that. Yes. That, and it, like you said, um, part of your statement, you said the, the reason why people are going in. Now, some people instinctively, they're trying to align with, you know, with order to a certain extent, and this is the way mm-hmm. in the society they think this is the only way to deal with that. Just like a, a lion or lioness and lion cub, they get up and they start scrapping with one another. They're strengthening themselves or, you know, they're jumping on a tree or doing different things to stimulate their muscles, keep them strong, keep them tight, learning how to hunt and so forth, um, wrestling with one another. This is Natural and different animals deal with that. Us, we have that natural, you know, desire to engage in some physical activity to strengthen our muscles, to make our muscles um, instruments, toned instruments to resonate the energy of the ba and the ba, the divine living energy of the ba and ba, so we can resonate harmoniously. Just like if you have a a guitar string, if it's limp, then it's not going to make any sounds when you pluck it. But if it's taut, when you pluck it, then it resounds a harmonious vibration. So mm. when we strengthen our muscles, we're just making our physical bodies toned instruments or tuned instruments so that we can be more receptive to the forces of nature. In reality, that's, that's what we're doing instinctively. So some people, they may be instinctively drawn to do something. They don't. They wouldn't intellectualize it like that, but they're drawn to do something. Some people who are connected to the albosome of iron and so forth, like, Benna in the Akan tradition or Ogun, Ogun in Yoruba phone tradition or Herubeth that they want to be around iron. And they feel comfortable mm-hmm. being around iron. It's the only place they can be around some iron. And they're stimulating their, you know, musculature, voluntary musculature and, and you know, their immune system and everything else. And that's what, you know, Ogun and Benna governs and they're in their element to the best of their capacity outside of, you know, waging war against our enemies. So, and protecting the community. So they're nationally drawn to you know, deal with some iron. You have other people who are, you know, connected to, like you were talking about, the connect to tornadoes, the winds, and so forth, and they're naturally drawn to aerobic activity. And they can't wait mm-hmm. to get into the aerobic class so they can generate that wind and, and just constantly being wielding that energy of wind as much as they can as far as they can in this society. They don't know necessarily intellectually why they're more drawn to that but anything that's wielding the energy of that electromagnetic power through the wind, they're on that. They become aerobic teachers and so forth, and always trying to get people to build up their wind and so forth because they're children of Yah or or Yah or watch that and so forth. But then you have other individuals mm-hmm. who are just, you know, out there just trying to, you know, capture somebody or, you know, just hanging out or doing whatever. They're lusting after different people and stuff like that. So, yeah, it depends mm-hmm. on you know, why people are doing what they're doing. But some of it is right. some of it is uh, rooted in a natural inclination. And some people are just going because they know they need to, you know, be more healthy and stuff like that. And this is the pathway that's been offered to them. They haven't seen any other pathway as of yet. So. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So it's basically like, you know, and I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna step back after this, but it seems to me like um, it's not necessarily anything wrong with going to the gym because a lot of people like purport that you know you shouldn't be lifting weights and blah 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 so on and so forth. But it's just more so having a knowledge of, like you said, just having that knowledge of um, of your okra. You know what I'm saying, and knowing how to move with that throughout the various aspects of life, including when it comes to your your you know your exercise. Regiment doing what works best for, you know, your your um, you know, your energy, your spirit, and whatnot. That's what I'm gathering from that. 
Exactly. Right. And there are okay. different ways to do that. And then there are people who will go further and start developing their own um, regimens that are different mm-hmm. um, than the, you know, the way people have typically been taught. Of course, the White Sound Spring is put for machines and stuff like that that approximate certain movements, but then there are other things that, you know, our people can be innovative and develop different forms of movement that are more effective uh, or more suited to the individual and so forth. But, yeah, what you know, us moving forward based on that inclination to strengthen ourselves, tone ourselves, stretch offense, you know, defense, focus, and so forth, we can utilize those things to, um, you know, achieve that objective. But it's still, at some point, we still have to deal with that. That can be a ritual in and of itself, depending on our focus. Because we're, if we're engaged in susu or reflection as we're, you know, in that process, then that's, that's, that is a ritual because you're wielding energy as you're doing that. But still, that's just in addition to ritual we do um, outside of those environments. Okay. All right. Yes. Much appreciated. Um Keep keep it coming. I'm about to order some books and all all that good stuff. So yeah, definitely. Uh Medase, that's up. Okay, Yeni I say that. We we appreciate that support. Absolutely. Okay. Um and we have uh, there's a question in the chat room. And yes, we do have again we have our we published sixteen books to date. All the ebook versions are free. The soft cover versions are range between eight and eleven dollars. So you can see the from the home our page, the publications page on the website. Um, there's a question, uh, what would be the best way to deal with the chaos in Baltimore? It doesn't seem like what's happening now is helping our people in that area. On one hand, we have to, of course, be cognizant of what's really happening. We we, have, we see what the media is showing, but of course, they're never going to show what's really happening. There's going to be totally different narratives of what's happening um, on the ground. So you more want to look at, you know, people who you know or you're connected to or other people who know other people who are using their cell phones and things like that and getting real footage of what's taking place um, as opposed to, you know, some people who are provocateurs, you know, have their little black agents out there doing things and then they get on the camera and it looks like they're doing something crazy and then the White Snow Spring rush with the TV cameras to those individuals that are doing something crazy and then they say, look at what the niggas in Baltimore are doing and all of that. It's all propaganda for the whites in our spring to promote their ideals. Um, but if, as far as what to be done, we would say for individuals to check out, we did that three-part series, uh, part one, and you can download it from our YouTube page. You can also download it directly from this Blog Talk radio page, um, OG, that parts one, two, and three. Part one is Nevolution versus Afurakani, Afurakani, Revolution and Resolution. Part two, Adebisa, the Akodie, or uh, Divination of Warfare. And then part three is Afuat, dealing with the lone wolf, the god of justice, war, death, and, you know, fighting and so forth in the hunt, battle. So we went into detail about the short-term, mid-term, and long-term solutions dealing with these kinds of things. But as we said earlier, the whites in our spring have been waging war against our people for thousands of years, nonstop, whenever they were able. It's only been over the last couple of hundred years that they've been really um, had the upper hand. But they will never stop hunting our people down until our people kill the whites in our spring who kill our people. When white cops murder our people, when our people kill those white cops consistently, then we will stop police brutality. That's why we said police brutality will stop through police brutality. When they get brutalized, when they get killed for murdering our people, they murder our people because they like murdering our people. They murder our people because we're black. That's why they murder our people. It has nothing to do with anything else. We don't play games and allow them to try to lull us to sleep with their pseudo little rationalization. They murder our people, number one, because they like doing that. And number two, most critically, they believe that they will get away with it. And they've been getting away with it, so that's the reason they move forward. But once our people make sure they they never get away with it, 
by killing the individuals who murder our people, not waiting around for them to play games in the legal system and come up with all kinds of justifications about why they can't be arrested and why. When the people murder our people and our people kill, hunt them down and kill them consistently, we will stop police brutality. Until then, nothing's going to stop. And then we have something to build upon. So that's the reality. And, of course, all the whites in our spring know that, and all of our people know that. But many of our people are too fearful to, uh, you know, proclaim that. But then some of our people are not fearful, and some of our people are not fearful with regard to actually executing that. So you're saying some of our people incrementally awakening to that reality, and they're moving on their own accord. And this is why the whites in our offspring don't want us to embrace ancestral religion. Because when we embrace ancestral religion, then we embrace our own cry, our own soul, our own divine consciousness. We embrace our ancestors and ancestors and their direction. We embrace the direction of Nyamewa Nyame, our great mother and great father. And then we're motivated by the supreme being. And nobody knows and can tell when the supreme being will motivate an individual one particular day to get up and massacre these murderers. You can't track that. It's impossible. You don't have enough manpower. You don't have the capacity to track it. So when people begin to re-embrace their ancestrally inherited tradition, not somebody trying to force you into a tradition, but you're born into a tradition, you incarnate with the abosom already connected to you from a previous incarnation, and you have a function to execute in the world. So when you align with the supreme being that animates you and guides you and move on your own volition, nobody can stop that and nobody can track it and nobody can predict it. And that's what we were dealing with when we checked out, talked about the lone wolf, Apuat. So People need to listen to those broadcasts so they can understand what we're talking about. They can understand themselves. And once they understand themselves, they begin to communicate with the great mother and great father, and they move on their own volition. And then it's over. So. Just want to check out. We have a couple more comments in the chat room. I want to make sure they weren't questions. Okay. All right. So, um, once again, we, do, we get out say we thank you for tuning in to the show. We're going to end it here. It's 1130. Uh, we will be back on tomorrow. We're going to send out a notification for that. Um, also, check out um, our YouTube page. We've uploaded new videos, a few new videos over the past couple of days. We've uploaded about uh, um, two of them over the past couple of days. So. Check those out. Please share those videos as well. Um, also, of course, Home Economic Development Models, the business of the week is Pan-African Design. So please check out the Home Economic Development Model page on our website. See all the various black businesses, Afurakani, Afurakani businesses, organizations, and institutions. Um, and again, we're supporting uh, one business per week for 52 weeks. This is week number 13. So. Please check that out. Um, follow us on Twitter as OG.fo, um, YouTube as OG.fo, Facebook as Afuraka.Afurakaet, and we also have an Akanfo Nanason group on Facebook. Um, once again, for those individuals who would like to uh, become distributors of our soft publications so you can generate income for yourself, you're simply purchasing wholesale and then you sell them retail, um, you can go to the publications page on our website for that. You can purchase publications as well. You can download the free ebook versions of our publications, which is the the books in their entirety, the ebook version. But then you can purchase the soft cover versions. But we also have the information, the distributor information document, as well as video. So you can learn about that. And also check out the FECU page um, dealing with establishing Nanason, Afurakani, Afurakani, Ancestral Religion, Feku, or study groups. 
there are study groups forming in different areas. And all it is, you can meet with one person or more. You're establishing a study group. Um, and this is your own study group. It's not up under our auspices. You just, we do have a curriculum that we recommend, starting with the Kukuzuntum, the ancestral jurisdiction. So when you go to the FECU page, you'll see um, that whole curriculum. But anybody, any of our people can start a study group. Some people get, they connect with one another online. Some people connect with one another, you know, in their locales. Um, for those who are um, establishing FECU or study groups, um, when you order the soft cover versions of our books, your price um, is 30% off for whatever books you order um, because you're, you know, formed a study group with one or more people. So check that out on the website as well. FECU is S-E-K-U-W. So that's on our OG.fo.com website. So, again, Yedase. We thank you for tuning in, and we will meet again. Yebeshia bio. Thank you.